Good evening, everybody. So it's just uh, amazing to see how many people are coming when we uh, spread the word ICO, the magic ICO. So I'm sure some of you have some cryptocurrencies. <coughs> Who has um, Bitcoins? And uh, Ether? And more than four, five tokens? Who's trading? Who has more than 100,000 euros in tokens? <laughs> okay, I wasn't expecting anybody um, raising the hand. So, um, great, welcome to our evening tonight. Um, we are happy to have you here. Um, this is an evening we um, pulled together with um, partners uh, you see here. We have the uh, Blockchain Bundesverband, we have the uh, Early Bird, we have uh, the guys from Winding Tree, um, myself, uh, DWF, um, and Innovation Forum Blockchain. Then we have also later on the panel uh, Martin, the uh, CEO of uh, NOS, is coming and uh, talking with us about uh, ICO, what it means. So then it's pretty easy, so I don't have to explain you anymore about uh, what an ICO is. Uh, sometimes people prefer to call it a token sale um, due to um, several reasons. Um, the um, legal situation, which uh, is trying to catch up with the um, evolution of the uh, technology. Um, this phenomenon has um, grown in, um, in uh, amplitude um, over the last um, Two years, it's um, basically the first um, ICO of the younger time was uh, Ethereum, uh, 2015. The first one was uh, Mastercoin, 2013. And uh, the explosion started basically 2016. And um, took uh, basically the um, blockchain um, economy by storm. Um, so, what's an ICO? That's, um, on the one hand, a crowdfunding mechanism, um, potential uh, corporate uh, financing tool. That's a way to bring in some um, needed uh, funds into the uh, blockchain community. And that's also what I picked up from an article in the New York Times, um, Our Generation's Pension Plan. <laughs> yeah? Um, I spoke at the uh, SEBIT and I said whoever started, uh, and I assume you all started in a similar way, which is you start with one currency, then a second one, then a third one. Then you start maybe to say, I will stick to that currency, I am loyal, I am not a trader, I am not a speculator, I will stick to my bitcoins, ether, whatever. And then you see, oh no, there's other currencies or tokens basically um, moving fast, and then you start switching, and then you start trading, and then you suddenly hooked up and uh, you're in the ecosystem. And <clears throat> so um, if you're a founder, but also if you're um, working for a large uh, company, you have, the, of course, the, um, um, the interest in wanting to understand um, how you could um, use it for your uh, own goals and your own targets. And uh, this is what this evening is going to be about. Um, the benefits for the ecosystem, the um, benefits for the individual um, company founder, but also um, big company. Um, my personal opinion and expectation is this is going to stay. This is going to be a new uh, financial tool which is going to be adopted by uh, the entire uh, industry worldwide. And uh, it's going to disrupt also um, just by the way how it attracts money and give rewards to, um, to um, early investors, but also innovators, it will change business model. Why? Because um, the ICO is only the channel uh, to basically uh, get money or new funds in. But um, the other way, um, so you put in some money to a project, into a project, into a coin, but that project gives you something back, which is the token. That's why some say that we moved to a token economy. Uh, some are talking about the crypto economy, but uh, the token economy is valid too. 
uh, token as a bearer of uh, rights, but also of value, and it has sometimes the form of a currency, and sometimes it is a so-called utility coin, like uh, Bitcoin is a currency, Ether is a utility coin. And um, the mechanism behind, um, which are basically uh, setting the rules, how these uh, currencies or tokens are working, um, uh, written down in um, white papers and uh, basically the monetary policy, the uh, regulating the inflation policy, the rewarding, the consensus. This is what's usually called the crypto economics. Um, this is a very important um, part which was missing um, at the uh, digital economy for years. Um, just to uh, give you an example, you were creating a beautiful platform but no one was showing up. And uh, with the uh, tokens, you have a um, tool which is uh, incentivizing people to join your platform, to invest their time, to invest their resources in it because they believe in uh, the service, the products, the value you are uh, sharing and you are uh, communicating. And um, because they also believe in a later reward and this creates kind of a viral circle which is basically pulling resources and people into these new platforms. And um, this is a driver behind. So the big question, of course, which we see since a while um, in the market, but also uh, lately, we have now the Bitcoin at um, how much? 4,000? Mm -hmm. Is it all time high? Not bad, no. <laughs> um, so, uh, fuels in a lot of money. We have now a total value of uh, Bitcoin of uh, billions of, uh, with a new product, uh, decentralized currency, which is uh, gaining um, with each crisis and which is also the symbol of uh, distrust in centralized authorities. And um, what's amazing is that um, it works. It works since it was launched. It works since 2009. Um, it works since um, it's exposed to every hacker in this world. Um, so it proved it works. And it also introduced a new infrastructure, which is the uh, blockchain, which uh, you can use for a lot of other um, tools too. So um, the question um, I'm confronted very often is um, if you uh, look at it from an investing point of view, but then also from a founder point of view. So the question is how long will this last? How long will this uh, ICO grace last? How long will uh, Bitcoin uh, stay until it um, basically crashes? And uh, there's a graphic I love from um, Eric uh, for Hearst from uh, Shapeshift. It goes like this and it's basically when it moves from thousand, well, from four hundred to thousand for the Bitcoin price, and then it crashes. You see, it crashes, and then it moves to three thousand, and it goes down again. It crashes, and then it moves just up and up and up. So, um, related to the ICO, we have now uh, lately uh, some um, crazy-sounding um, evaluations of um, projects. Um, where people say, how can it be that three or four guys are just uh, coming up with a, um, with a solution, they haven't even proven themselves, uh, sometimes they don't even have an MVP, and the value is so incredibly high. So they are all great. This is a tulip mania. This is what the economists are saying. Um, if you look, and that's basically the only chart of my introduction, if you look at the price of the Bitcoin, you see that basically just two years ago, it was uh, at 150 euros, and it's now moving up to 4,000. And if I look at that uh, graphic which uh, Eric was uh, tweeting, it's basically, you know, I said it's a scam, it's crashed. I said it's a scam, it's crashed, and then it moves on. So when you look at the ICO and these high evaluations, you can look at it from two points. The, um, Startups collecting the funds have collected Ether, Bitcoin, which are liquid, which can be traded on exchange and therefore be for their own risk management, traded back into um, fiat currencies, euros, um, 
Swiss franc, um, dollar. Because it has a price, it can be traded and sold easily, you find buyers. Um, on the other hand, you have to take in consideration that many of the, much of the money which is now currently um, investing in ICOs, because that process is quite tricky, um, comes from people having cryptocurrencies. So uh, Chris uh, Baninske from uh, ARK, formerly ARK Investment, hmm? Bernisk from um, ARK Invest, uh, said at the uh, token summit in May in New York that um, three quarters, 75 percent of the money, the funds moving into ICOs are already existing cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin or Ether. And whether you look at the Bitcoin curve or the Ether curve, it's even more dramatic, you just need to look two years back and you have between uh, 2015, January, and today, a multiple of 26. So now let's assume you have made an ICO with a startup valued at 20 millions. The value is the price of the Bitcoin of today multiplied with the numbers of funds you have collected. But if you apply that, um, that um, formula, which is not scientific, it, uh, but it's a number which was communicated, you can take it as it is, you would say that possibly three quarters, 75 percent of the money being invested was actually at that price. And so it means that for the investor in your uh, startup, uh, they didn't invest at 20 million. For them, they basically invested 25, um, a 25th of uh, 20 million. So it means um, a very lower um, evaluation. And um, if you look at the uh, way how Bitcoin is uh, created and how the um, quantity of Bitcoin is uh, developing, you see that there are already a lot of people who basically have only have a lot of Bitcoins already now today, but at very low evaluations. And they understand that business because it was successful for them. They loved blockchain. You don't need to explain them how it works. They believe it in. And they will go on and feed projects. The more daring, the better. And now put this in context that it's a pain to get your first Bitcoin or Ether. No? How was it with you? I mean, it took me six weeks to get my first Bitcoin. <laughs> And uh, I have friends who failed miserably in uh, passing the QYC of uh, Kraken because you need to make uh, the QYC, you need to uh, have a picture taken of your passport, sending it in, and you just need to have your finger, your thumb on the part of the passport, and then they bounce back. Uh, it takes them two weeks to bounce back. So it's a, it's a pain. So this is why I think this will also fuel further the um, growth of Bitcoin and with that also of the entire crypto economy, because actually we are here already a lot, but uh, in total, most people just start to sometimes have heard of maybe Bitcoin. So when the masses are going to uh, really consider investing in it, then uh, there's just a limited supply. So this will even drive farther up the um, ecosystem. And um, in that context, um, I don't know if uh, Nikita is here. So, um, yeah, Nikita, so uh, maybe come. So, just uh, before we uh, move on, um, because of that uh, gap between the, um, the, um, the mass market not having reached, because it's so difficult to access uh, uh, the tokens, uh, Nikita is uh, just uh, working on a great project, which I'm happy to uh, present. Thank you very much, Sven. Yeah, connecting on um, where Sven left off. Thank <laughs> you. 
<lacht> Soll ich so anfangen? Ja. Soll ich starten? Okay. okay, hi everybody. I'm just start out like that. <lacht> A little bit of censorship going on here. Ah, we got my presentation. Thank you very much. <coughs> so nice to see your house so full tonight. A couple of months ago we started off with just a couple of people and now it's so full. Thank you for coming and listening to what we got to say tonight. Um, <coughs> so connecting to where uh, Sven basically left off, we identified three weak spots which ICOs have today, of which we think um, makes ICOs less great than they could have been um, already. So me being um, a business major, uh, from coming from a business major background and now um, being an Ethereum developer, um, the first time when I um, came across ICOs, th th these three things like, came immediately to my mind. Um, you've got volatility, exclusivity, and congestion going on. So imagine this scenario. Um, you do an ICO and you close on 340 and then you cash out on 280 and you promise your users to buy solar panels. So um, imagine going from here to there, that's a lot of less solar panels basically. So everybody who ever wrote a business plan knows how tight calculations and margins can be. Um, so these things are really cr crucial um, that you really get the money that you um, basically rely on. And um, exclusivity, um, it's us, everybody here, um, being crypto heads and uh, owning uh, cryptocurrencies and tokens and everything. But uh, for example, my Facebook Messenger is full of friends asking me, oh, what's this going on? What's all up with that hype? Where can I buy this? And uh, oh, why do they, uh, are they asking uh, for the size of my underwear to just buy some crypto uh, currency? Why cannot I go and buy it in the bank and, and things like that? And I tell them, um, these things won't get better for any time soon. So why don't we just take something everybody has already and this is, for example, a credit card. So it's millions of wallets versus billions of credit cards. So why can't we just go ahead and say, hey, you can buy a token directly with a credit card without messing around with exchanges and everything, and thereby separate the flow of data, basically. Um, your money flowing into the project which you want to fund and giving out a call um, to a smart contract, which will basically transfer you the tokens then. And um, what we have seen with many ICOs prior uh, in the last months where the ICO hype went big is many people crying on the internet not getting a hold of the tokens because uh, they were the rich guys which bribed the miners with high transaction fees and they were the first ones. And everybody basically, um, this is Indiana Jones, you can see him unfortunately, everybody is trying to get in into that one block where the, where the sale is starting and uh, all the poor guys then uh, fall down, um, which we just, this, this graphic is just a couple of minutes old, some ICOs going on again. Um, you see the gas limit is at 6.7 uh, million, it's an Ethereum thing and it's, every block is basically full. So something is going on again and some people are falling off the table. Um, so why don't we just cut all the bullshit in the middle and we go just like that. You take your credit card, um, you give somebody your money and um, a call is being sent to some smart contract sending you a token. Um, when we were, uh, last time when we met at uh, Early Bird, um, some crypto enthusiasts laughed at me for that uh, solution, maybe you remember. Um, uh, it wasn't you laughing, because the purists of course say, hey, this is not decentralized and blah, blah, but remember not long time ago we sent DVDs via mail because internet bandwidth wasn't that great yet. So maybe we just let the crypto cr purists aside and just do the pragmatic way and I would like um, after the event having a beer or two um, to hear your opinion whether you love it or hate it or you would like to be uh, one of the early adopters of this solution just uh, hit me up. Thank you very much. Cool. cool. Thanks. Thanks Nikita. Um, does it work? Yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, uh, of course, uh, he's with uh, Astratum. So, um, but now I'd like to um, hand over, because uh, this is not a one-man show. Um, this is a partner event, and um, I'd like to hand over to um, Alex. No? No, actually, this is the agenda, so it would be you, but uh, yeah. But if you... You want to go ahead? Yeah. Okay. So does it work? Does the mic work? Yeah. 
just are you sure yeah yeah cool yeah hello everybody um i'm alex i'm uh, working with early bird venture capital we are kind of a conventional old school vc firm um still digging into this sector uh, we've done two deals so far which uh, some of you might know um, that's big chain db and shapeshift um, the most recent one and um, yeah internally i'm very happy to cover everything decentralized for a while now i'm uh, heavily engaged with the sector also for my uh, personal uh, for for personal reasons and and the passion um, and um, yeah i'm happy to use the next 10 minutes um, to talk a little bit um, about the perspective VC funds have on the on the whole sector. Um, so that's basically the three topics I'd like to touch, um, the pain points of venture financing as we know it today. Um, followed by the rise and impact of crypto tokens, especially on the financial um, side of, of the world. Um, and then finally, uh, finish with a, with a brief outlook. So how many founders are in this room? Okay, that's a, that's a lot. I would say about 25% of, of all people. Um, so then most of you will be very familiar um, with the pain points startups are facing when raising a financial uh, funding. And um, there are many pain points actually. So the first one is it takes a long time. It's about six months uh, doing a roadshow, more or less um, get a lot of no's, um, what can be very frustrating. Um, and it's also for um, even more matured companies still um, a big pain point uh, with regard to access to capital. Uh, think of projects or, or like matured companies such as Medium or SoundCloud, for example, uh, which both have very strong communities, supporters, customers um, who would love to directly invest into those companies um, as, as a shareholder but can't because they're excluded um, by, um, by law, basically. Um, that's only uh, accredited investors and uh, institutional investors getting in this game. Uh, another big problem is um, what, what I call um, the hit big or miss big approach. And that's very much related to the very fundamental business model um, of venture capital. So imagine um, you're working uh, with a VC firm and you're raising a fund um, of 100 million, early stage for example, and um, what happens then is that you allocate this money by investing into about 30 companies in seed stage and series A rounds initially. And uh, history has proven that out of those 30 companies you're investing into, about 25 won't bring you any significant returns because they become either write-offs um, or bring you back your liquidation preference at one, maybe two X the money you invested. And that's um, not enough uh, to make your investors, that's the LPs, limited partners, that's the guy giving, giving money to us, um, to the venture capitalists, um, to make them happy. Um, so what we need is uh, companies which have the potential, um, at least in early stages, theoretically, um, to become very valuable, um, speaking about 300 million euros upwards, and the consequences that many very interesting projects and companies um, won't get VC money because they just don't have the potential to become big enough. That's in, in many um, in many cases the reason for me to, to say no to very strong teams, very cool products, visions, everything is right, timing, um, but just the, the sheer potential um, isn't there and that's that's a big problem also on a, um, um, on, a on a global level and on, on a um, macroeconomical level. For LPs um, it's, uh, it's a different thing, um, of course they compare venture financing to other asset classes um, and there might also be um, more attractive alternatives. So what, what's the consequence of this uh, business model um, or of the hit big, miss big approach uh, we've seen over the last decades? Um, it's basically the creation um, of centralized networks. So as I said, VCs are looking for very special animals out there and typically those companies with the potential to become very big show specific patterns and that's something such as network lock-in effects, hyper growth mechanics, viralities, um, creation of significant new markets um, or even shaping, creating whole new industries. Um, some of those 
you are very familiar with, um, and they bring a lot of value, a lot of benefits for, for many people, um, but they also come with certain downsides. Um, and these downsides um, are getting more and more obvious these days. Um, I just threw in some, some buzzwords here. So algorithmic abuse is a huge topic, censorship, filter bubbles. Um, think, think of the power Google or Facebook have, for example. Single points of failure. Um, think of our server infrastructure, Amazon Web Services, um, shutdowns, for example, mass surveillance, um, what comes to my mind, uh, Apple phones and NSA backdoors, um, wealth creation for very few people. Um, that's mainly the, the shareholders, maybe early employees uh, of, of those companies. Um, yeah, may, maybe think of, of Silicon Valley, of Brexit, of Donald Trump. Um, we, we have a huge gap of rich and poor, um, and this is also driven by these developments, lack of innovation. Um, if I see a company attacking Facebook, um, which might have a very promising product, making making the whole thing maybe three x better, uh, probably uh, we wouldn't do it just because these giants are too powerful, and um, so that's slowing down innovation. Um, the good thing is many people in the room and a lot more uh, out there are building solutions to address all of these problems, and I can now only talk about a few of those. Um, and the first thing um, I want to I want to talk about is uh, what's so special about crypto tokens. Um, I'm I'm very much surprised about this audience. Pretty cool that so many people raise their hands uh, and actually hold uh, different tokens. So I I just assume everybody's familiar with how you could categorize them and what different kinds uh, of of tokens are out there. Um, but generally speaking, um, they all share some uh, characteristics. Um, they they all have in common. And that's uh, at first liquidity. Um, in, in the equity world, there practically aren't any secondary markets, right? If I'm holding shares of a company, I need to wait for the next financing round. And then if I'm very lucky, I could find somebody um, buying some uh, uh, from me. But it's, uh, it's not, not very liquid, whereas tokens um, can, be, can be traded um, right away. Um, access, um, that's also addressed. Um, the equity world is very exclusive, um, also very local. So usually companies are raising money from the VCs within their ecosystems, uh, at least in early stages. Um, that's different uh, for tokens and ICOs. Uh, everything is global from day one. Um, and the growth mechanisms are very, very interesting. Um, so what we've seen uh, in the past are network effects, right? Facebook is only cool if your friends uh, are hanging out there. Otherwise, it wouldn't work. Um, and in the token, on, uh, in the token world, um, there's something even much more powerful, uh, and that's basically um, kind of a, a, <laughs> a 2.0 version of Facebook, where Facebook is not owned by any shareholders anymore, but by the users providing uh, content. Um, so the effect is that uh, the more people are joining the networks, um, the better its usability gets, and also um, the more the underlying tokens appreciate in value. Um, what, is, what is kind of a network effect on steroids? Uh, we've never seen something comparable that's crazy. Just crazy growth. Um, we've seen one chart, um, there are much more. Uh, execution of rights um, is a topic uh, where we're still at the very infancy. I think there's much more room uh, for, for improvement um, to use smart contracts and bake in specific rules, um, make tokens more equitable, so to say. It's very experimental still. Um, of course, in, in the equity world, you would need to go to courts, uh, what takes time, etc. Um, to um, uh, to, to get to your right. Um, capital efficiency now, that's that's something um, where I see still um, a, l a lot of problems um, in the in the ICO world. Uh, many projects are, wa are raising way too much money uh, in early phases. Um, this could easily be prevented by using using smart contracts or, uh, or raising money in multiple steps, define whatever kind of, of milestones, etc. So that's that, that we need to improve. Uh, and of course, due diligence and regulations is a topic um, in the equity world. It's pretty much standardized. Um, you definitely know which KPIs to look at and which uh, which red flags there might pop up, etc. And in, in crypto land, it's still a little um, wild west. And many people, um, also Chris Bernis, for example, um, I also did some research work and published it lately, um, is still wild west. 
Okay. So um, what's the impact now on the, on the world of venture financing, having um, understood the basic characteristics of those tokens? There are some people, uh, some very strong thought leaders, um, such as Nava Ravikant, the founder um, of AngelList and CoinList, um, who very recently stated, um, quoting now, you can basically throw the venture playbook out of the window. This, comp this, by referring to token sales and ICOs, completely destroys the existing venture business model, which is based on proprietary access early on. Now everybody has that. That's a pretty strong statement, and I have to admit, the first five seconds I was thinking about it, I was kind of agreeing, um, but reflecting more and more um, upon it, I don't, I don't see it this way um, necessarily. Um, so I tried to get some uh, some data, given the short period of time. Um, ICOs are outvaluing uh, early stage VC funding volumes. Was a headlined a headline in, a, in an article which was uh, published a month ago, and um, that's obviously true. Um, the dark uh, graphs uh, you can see are reflecting the volume of ICO funding, which is significantly going up, um, uh, especially in May and, uh, and June uh, this year. Um, I think if we continue um, the momentum uh, of this of the sector, uh, it will get even the gap will will get even bigger. Um, that's that's very interesting and also kind of alarming uh, for many VCs. But the most important thing, um, or the question we have, like what would be the impact on institutional um, uh, investing, isn't, isn't answered by this slide, um, because it doesn't tell us where the money comes from. It's just saying we're using new mechanisms uh, to raise money. And um, I couldn't get any um, reliable data, at least. Um, you know, all these uh, analysis of uh, token distributions after ICOs, etc. And there you can see some percentages, but you still don't know who exactly is behind those uh, public keys. Um, what I what I see though is um, that indeed um, institutional money is getting in the sector. So as as Sven mentioned. Um, there are these uh, kind of uh, uh, crypto millionaires and, and whales, etc., coming from this ecosystem, specifically mine, uh, miners and uh, exchanges, um, which are um, throwing a lot of money into the pot. Um, but there are also more and more um, so-called crypto funds uh, coming from different backgrounds. So could be VC firms, um, for example, Union Square Ventures, uh, Andreessen Horowitz is mentioned here, um, which are directly investing in tokens, um, and there are others exclusively investing in tokens, such as Polychain Capital, etc. So um, they are gearing up, and um, in, uh, institutional money is getting into the sector. It's just about to happen. And then, of course, as a founder, you will always ask, okay, why would I actually need to work with these institutional um, uh, people? Why? Shouldn't I just go with the retail investors? Might be easier. I get a better distribution, and um, I think there are there are reasons for this. Um, value propositions for founders uh, could, on the one hand, be um, that usually uh, professional VC firms and also crypto funds will have deep uh, expertise um, uh, network and, and really understand what they're doing, um, doing their homeworks. Um, so in case they, the founders have run through um, kind of a due diligence process and the uh, funding is announced afterwards, this could, could help to be very strong signaling into the markets. ICO structuring is another topic, it's somehow related to equity financing rounds. There are of course differences, um, but I think the mechanics we're going to see um, are, are going to be baked into the token and uh, there will be parallels. And also long-term reliable partners. A lot of people, be it retail investors or, or also some of the institutional players, miners, whales, etc., are following pump and dump schemes. They get in to the ICOs, um, make their money, get out their 5x uh, and, and dump it again, what isn't very sustainable and um, uh, entrepreneurs have an uh, incentive to have long-term partners as well. Value prop on uh, LPs, again, that's the guys giving money um, to, to venture capital and other funds. For them, of course, they could ask, hey, now it's, it's open, everybody could do it, uh, why, why don't I just directly invest? Uh, why would I need a fund? And that's basically the same reasons as we, we see today. Domain expertise is missing, early access. I think this is a topic 
Um, still, even though we have ICOs, uh, we see a lot of pre-sales in this field, um, so a lot of funds are getting in early on. Or we see some kind of hybrid financing rounds, um, where, the, with, where the projects are first being backed by institutional investors doing equity rounds, then build their products, uh, products and two to three years later uh, actually go out with an ICO. We've seen that with IPFS, Filecoin, for example. Enigma is another one. Um, they're, they're like Civic, um, basic attention token, that they are much more. Uh, and I think this is going to continue. Okay, and um, yeah, regarding the outlook, I, I think we're still at the very beginning of this whole industry. Um, not software, but tokens are eating the world, to, to bastardize a, a famous quote from, from Mark Andreessen. Um, there's much more to come. We are seeing it now uh, with different token models, especially in, in the PE world. Um, and there are much more assets to tokenize, uh, such as stocks, real estate, fine arts, commodities, um, yeah, di digital items and gaming, for example. And that's specifically interesting whenever you have physical goods which cannot be divided into many pieces, such as real estate, like flat would be the um, smallest unit of account. Uh, you could now basically make liquid and also divide it into more, much more pieces. And um, yeah, that's how the, uh, the, the graph uh, Sven showed could be, could be continued. Um, over the next decades, there's many reports out there, and um, I, I picked the one from World Economic Forum, predicting that we will go from an average um, uh, average market cap of about 100 billion dollars, 2017. Let's see how this how this year is going to end, to about 8 trillion uh, billion market cap of tokenized assets in 2027, and that's 80x multiple of 80 from now on. So. I think uh, this is this is gonna gonna grow still, and uh, even though there might be corrections, um, the the overall tendency um, is growth. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Some short key takeaways. Uh, still many unknown unknowns. I'm kind of daily changing my mind on certain topics, <laughs> right? So maybe if I, if I need to have this talk uh, in two weeks, I will. Uh, um, I will tell you completely different stories, <laughs> could happen. Um, maybe ventures hit big, miss big approach or paradigm uh, might shift uh, in the future. Just because of the liquidity, um, venture will get further democratized, but only to certain degrees. I, I still think there will be room for, for institutional money getting in. And yeah, tokens, tokens are the future. Uh, happy to discuss further on, and thanks for your attention. So, thank you, Alex. Uh, it's really interesting to have you here and showing us uh, the point of view from the uh, VC. Um, I'm very glad that uh, for tonight we have really experts from different angles um, looking and contributing to the um, ICO uh, phenomenon. Um, I like also to pick up the phrase of uh, Alex and say what uh, can be tokenized will be tokenized. Um, just to remind you some um, minor things, if uh, somebody needs to wash um, its hand, you can do it here in the back. Uh, also, I forgot to give you an indication about uh, the program So this evening. So uh, we had, um, after now, the um, um, Alexander. Uh, we will have now um, Nina from DWF and um, Arnab from uh, Cycus talking about the regulatory view and best practice. Then we have a short break where we can get uh, some drinks and uh, foods. And um, afterwards, we will have um, two projects uh, presenting um, tonight. One is uh, Winding Tree. It's a tokenized uh, answer to the um, fractions in the, uh, uh, in the, um, in the um, tourism um, industry cross-currency um, and cross-system um, process. And then we have uh, East Phoenix, East Phoenix. And afterwards, uh, we capture this up with a panel talk where we have also Martin from Gnosis uh, joining. And uh, so I give over to um, Nina and Anna. Thank you, Sven. 
Um, I want to use the opportunity, as always, when I speak to highlight the existence of the Blockchain Bundesverband. Just a quick question. Is there anyone in the room who is not aware of the existence of the Blockchain Bundesverband yet? Still a couple of hands. <laughs> Yeah, so we formed the Blockchain Bundesverband in June this year. Um, basically, about 20 blockchain startups together with three universities and a couple of um, people involved. And the goal is to get uh, blockchain mentioned in a positive way in the next coalition agreement after we vote it all in September. Um, because the politicians we talked to so far, they all told us if you don't get it into the coalition agreement, um, the next four years nothing will change. So that was a one-time opportunity and we formed it very quickly and have now about um, 20 working groups up and running which are open to everybody in the community. So everybody who would like to contribute is um, hardly invited to join and this time I actually got the list of our working groups um, just to give you um, a flavor of, of what we are all looking into. Um, so we've got an important working group um, on digital identity. Um, and then um, we've got supply chain, legal services and legal tech, uh, sharing and collaborative uh, economy, smart cities. We've got uh, Industry 4.0, uh, Connection to Smart X IoT Devices. That's actually an interesting group. Um, it's a little bit cross-industry. Um, we've got Voting Infrastructure, Tokens, Crypto Economy, ICOs, that group. Um, that's the, I'm heading that group, actually. Energy, Finance, Insurance, uh, Science and Healthcare. I saw Sunke. Where are you? He is actually heading those two groups. Um, we've got real estate, Achim is, is heading that working group. Um, general legal framework, that group is taking care about you know, questions surrounding uh, closing contracts and uh, general terms and conditions, um, disclosure requirements, things like that. And then we've got privacy and data protection, obviously another big issue. IP and licenses, we've got a corporate law group, um, Daniel? Raise your hand. Ah, oh, yeah. <laughs> right in the back. So he's actually heading the, the, the corporate group. Um, tax accounting, also very important. And then we've got a couple of groups which are not really working on identifying pain points, which we want to present to the politicians. Um, but on pilot projects, um, that includes a collection of projects we can actually present to the public authorities to play around with blockchain solutions themselves. So whoever has like a, uh, a project going on which could apply in that sector, um, get in touch. I think they are working currently on the um, CAR filing, kfz zulassung um, which um, they are looking out for uh, a couple of communities which are willing to um, play the blockchain solution a couple of months alongside the traditional way of doing it. And then uh, obviously they are looking into real estate, uh, land register, things um, like that. And then we've got education, what is very much at the heart of one of our managing board members. Um, so we're trying to partner up with universities and we've got uh, a group ethics and governance uh, which is looking into the typical governance problems especially with the public blockchains. So if uh, any of those topics uh, are of interest for you get in touch and we gladly integrate you in our working groups. So that was it for the Bundesverband and yeah. So I hand over to Anup to give it a start with our presentation. Hi, thank you, Nina, and thank you, Sven, for inviting me also over here. And I think if we are working as a community and the co you all want a community to come up, I think this kind of working groups is very important. And please participate, even if you can give maybe a few hours in a month, that's also useful. So please consider it as an option. Please join. Now coming to the question on ICOs and what are the legal issues and non-legal issues, whether you should be afraid or not. 
there are some differences between me and Nina also and other people also. What are the classification of tokens? Some say classification has to be done purely on legal aspects. Some say it's an economic aspect because you have to come under very atomic level on what are the classification grounds of an ICO tokens. So I have cla classified it under three categories. One is purely utility token. That can be both payment tokens and a non-payment tokens. Then you have a non-utility token, which has no utility, but you just use it uh, for maybe an asset backed, or there are hybrid tokens, which has both utility as well as an asset function. Now, when we can see the SEC order came and everything, you've, it's a very interesting moment. When it just about to cross one billion market in the ICO field, then SEC came in. After SEC, all our regulators, they are best friends to each other, they started copying and pasting. It's a very good plagiarism model and they're using it properly. And there's also issues whether the SEC ruling is an executive order, first of all, it's not a court order, so it's not a law. It's just an executive order. And an executive, and it's also a report, it's not even an order, it's a report. And whether the report has covered all the legal aspect. What I personally also feel on certain aspects that they have talked about initially about investor security and when later they came in the end of their report, they've lost the space of investor security and how to protect with this 1800s judgment and those kind of ruling without going into any jurisprudential aspect of what is investor security, who are the investors. Very few tokens are securities and what about the other tokens and what are those securities? Now coming to the question whether it's uh, so this is this market, which I have, like, I got the information from Autonomous. They did actually a very good job uh, by analyzing it in a proper graph, a graphical way. And you can see it's like one billion when it started to reach and they said, okay, now we need to come, the SEC thought. Now what are the issues? What are the issues that we should talk about the ICOs? Is it only about securities law or there is something else? Securities law is one part. If I am considering about the European legal aspect, there are MIFID regulations and there are other aspects which can be of useful for the European legal aspect. And I think they, Nina will talk about this in later slides. The other aspect which is very crucial is the consumer protection law. A lot of projects are promoting in such a way that they will solve the problem, the world problem in a second. Just give them money. And they are selling, okay, you give me money, I will give this, 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 this benefits. If they do not do, if the projects go bankrupt, like if they cannot do, they say, okay, then you lose your money, but in a very small terms and condition. I did an interesting research right now. I tried to find whether the ICOs, after the ICOs happen, they put the terms and condition on their website. Most of the projects, they do not. Why they're afraid then? Why they are not putting the terms and condition on the website? If they are so much about decentralized, full of transparency, why there is a lack of transparency in this aspect? The second coming is the data protection law. A lot of projects are taking data uh, in the pre-ICO stage and post-ICO stage both. What about the data? How they are controlling this data, the personal information and everything? The PR activities, how they're happening at this point of time. No one knows who are the PR agencies, how the PR agency are collecting data, and this is a very crucial aspect where PR are representing, sometimes the tokens are not. The VAT law, Nina will come on this aspect, if it's a product and if you're selling a license, say, okay, this is a, a IP product, so there was a VAT obligation, how they're going to fulfill all those obligations. Creating an ICO vehicle in some weird jurisdiction doesn't help you. First of all, if you want to also survive in the market and in order to replace the VC also, you have to have some credibility. Without credibility, without face, you are actually ruining the market ecosystem. There are a lot of good projects, a lot of good coins, but there are also a lot of shitty tokens and shitty projects, and people know it. And we have to weed those projects out, and it's a community initiative that should come into play. Now I would like to give to Nina to discuss further. Thanks. Yeah, and um, well, let's take a deeper look into what, what are tokens, what do they represent, and how do we lawyers actually try to enter into that topic. Now, first of all, there is currently no robust infrastructure where you could get like the ICO off the shelf. Um, there is no developed market, no developed documentation, no developed procedures so far yet. A lot of the ICOs um, we've seen so far had maybe not been truly legally structured. I completely understand that because it's it, it evolved from a different world and sometimes in early stages 
also with the claim that this whole thing is outside of the legal environment because it's just code, um, but actually it isn't. So uh, what we do is we always try to get to the content of the token as such. We are trying to look through this digital something and understand what the token actually represents. And the typical thing which it represented in case of Bitcoin is, is a cryptocurrency. Um, so cryptocurrencies are tokens which come along with payment, which are used for payment means um, between different parties and which allow um, actually to measure the value of the purchased good. So it, it makes the price comparable. Um, there is now uh, a current suggestion in the amendment for the fourth uh, anti-money laundering directive on EU level. That's actually the first one um, uh, within the EU uh, trying to um, bring a definition for what they call virtual currencies. And if you read that, digital representation of value that is neither issued by a central bank or a public authority, nor necessarily attached to a fiat currency, but is accepted by nat natural or legal persons as a means of payment and can be transferred, stored or traded electronically, then I guess you get immediately that this is very broad and everything that within the um, blockchain community would be seen as cryptocurrency is clearly captured here. So that's not in place yet, um, but we expect, I don't know, maybe by the end of the year, that this um, European directive will come into place and then we, we have a definition for the phenomenon of, of cryptocurrency. That's one sort. But a token can represent way more and, and you mentioned already, and you as well, a couple of those. Um, shares, financial instruments, licenses, vouchers. Um, and for all the different types of assets that are represented by a token, uh, different um, civil law and regulatory law regimes apply. So when we take then a look into the main categories that we've seen, we actually um, working on an analysis of ICOs uh, within the tokens and ICO working group of the Bundesverband. And the most relevant categories from a legal perspective, that's not a typical you know, classification you would see within the blockchain world, but from a legal perspective, the most relevant uh, categories are cryptocurrencies, as just mentioned, then the equity tokens. And equity tokens, we always um, understand as a token which come along with uh, profit participation rights plus voting rights. So if that comes, in combination and the voting rights go pretty far, especially like include things, um, voting on uh, the profit distribution or voting on electing managing directors, things like that, then you're very close to, to an equity token. We in Germany then have, a sec have, have this third category, profit participation token, which from many other jurisdictions will be simply another class of equity tokens. But we in Germany ac actually distinguish between those two. The profit participation tokens usually only come along with the profit participation right, but no or at least no substantial voting rights. In the finance area, where I come from, we would call this mess. It's a mezzanine financing. It's not an equity financing. Um, and then, completely different from those three, who are all kind of financial instruments, are the next two. Um, software tokens, or software license tokens, um, which we would call tokens who simply grant access to the use of a software or a software environment. Might be a platform that you're creating. Um, and asset tokens, which represent either try to represent the title in a tangible asset or at least the economic value of a tangible asset. So something you can actually grab, real estate, cars, diamonds, whatever. Those are clearly no securities from a German perspective. They are out of the financial regulatory regime. But with those tokens, you're right into the VAT problem. Um, because uh, VAT, 
and that's the same as the regulatory regime, always applies, at least in Europe, where the user is located. So as Arnab already mentioned, it doesn't matter from where you start an ICO. It rather matters where you offer the token, right? The jurisdictions where you offer the token, that are the jurisdictions that are relevant for the regulatory view and at least with regard to VAT, also for the tax perspective. So what is a token as such, you know, disregarding what it represents? We in Germany have like a fixed number of what we call absolute rights. Um, and those are basically um, receivables and, um, and assets, uh, like uh, physical assets. And obviously the token is neither one, right? You don't have a right against a third party purely out of the token. Um, and you, you cannot hold it in your hands. So the problem is that in Germany, this thing token is not protected by law as an absolute right. Um, we would call it rather sonstiger Gegenstand, other object, um, which exists and which is acknowledged by civil law. For example, um, the uh, sales contract provisions apply uh, accordingly to other objects, but it would be rather called exchange, not sale. Um, but it, yes, it's comparable to something like no know-how, right? Know-how is, is also one of those things. So we actually can deal with it from a, from a legal perspective, um, and you can transfer it. Uh, it's merely on a contractual basis. There is no in-rem protection, right? That's one of the issues we want to address, because if that spreads, especially within consumers, uh, we think the legislator sh should think about uh, applying some kind of absolute protection to tokens as well. And then you've got actually to differ from the transfer of the electronic token, the transfer of the asset that is represented by that token, because there might be different rules applying to that. Um, so actually, you can only really attach something to a token if there are no specific form requirements for transferring the represented asset, right? Because otherwise, the transfer, for example, real estate, you can only transfer by getting an entry into the land register. If you don't have that, you don't get the title to that property. So you can't simply transfer real estate by the transfer of a token. Um, so I know that there are a couple of groups currently trying to make up their mind how to solve, how to solve that issue. Um, and that's simply due to, to the fact that um, in, in a lot of cases, uh, statutory law mandates certain legal benefits only when certain requirements are met. That's not only the case for, for property, for land, but also, for example, for shares in limited liability com companies or for um, KGs, uh, limited partnerships. Um, because all those entities uh, require that you go either to the notary or you get an entry into the commercial register. So those things are also difficult to truly attach to a token. And then um, you always, if, if you have a real world asset attached to the token, you always have to think about the possibility that this object might be um, acquired in good faith, right? So if, you, if, if we're meeting on the street and uh, I'm saying here, here's my microphone, do you wanna buy my microphone? And you're saying, oh yeah, have 10 euro, and I hand it over to you, then you're protected because I hold the asset in my hands and you can actually acquire it in good faith because I hand over to you the asset itself. Um, and then it's gone, even though maybe the token is still mine and I can sell the token later the day to somebody else. Those things are also to be kept in mind um, when you're thinking about attaching a real-world asset uh, to a token. Same thing, for example, if the other way around, 
Um, we're having a nice party later on here. I'm drinking a couple of beer. I'm completely drunk when I get home, and then I spread my tokens. From the civil law point of view, I can claim them back the next morning, right? Because I was like out of my mind <laughs> at that point in time. Um, in, in that case, the token might also not represent what it claims to stand for. Aside of those issues, we've got another one, which is a huge one, actually. That is the multi-jurisdictional challenge. There is no such thing as an overarching, unified, legal, global system. Unfortunately, jurisdictions are broken down to countries. We have like 192 countries around the world. Um, we have multiple bilingual, um, bilateral or multilateral legal agreements. Think about the EU alone, what massive number of regulatory um, rules uh, we have here. So, unfortunately, the legal world is splintered in lots of fractions. And it's not possible, really not possible, to observe any and all requirements we have around the globe. So anyone who wants to go global needs to start with core jurisdictions, try to figure out how things work there, and then slowly expand. That's what you know, any kind of um, international company does when it's going to offer its services or products um, abroad. There's nobody who's able to actually start on a global basis right away. And I really like that sentence from Stephen Paley, who said, distributed presence means distributed legal liability and distributed compliance and, I added, tax obligations. Businesses with international operations are well acquainted with this. That's unfortunately so true, and there's no way um, to get around this. So be mindful of the multi-jurisdictional challenge. Um, check where you actually offer your token. It's even more important than checking where you're located. Um, carefully choose the governing law where possible. Um, in principle, in civil law area, you can choose the law that applies to your contracts. But always, there's always uh, some mandatory law in any jurisdiction where you offer the tokens uh, which will overrule your contract, like, for example, consumer protection laws, data protection laws. Um, obviously, the whole regulatory area is nothing that you can opt out by choosing another jurisdiction. Yeah, regulation. Regulators start to take action. We see more and more um, regulators voicing um, their opinion, their, their maybe first slight opinion um, about uh, the, the token world. Uh, in Germany, BaFin uh, already said a while ago that they would see cryptocurrencies to be so-called units of account, Rechnungseinheiten, and that is actually a financial instrument pursuant to our banking laws. That actually differs from more or less the rest of the European Union, um, interestingly enough. Um, and it basically means that the commercial trade requires a license of, um, from the BaFin. I already mentioned the um, upcoming amendment of the fourth uh, EU anti-money laundering directive with its new and first definition of virtual currency and what it will actually um, bring into the field is a full KYC obligation for gatekeepers, and gatekeepers are wallet providers and crypto exchangers. So that will be coming soon in, in the EU. Then um, the EU discussed already a while ago, I think it was earlier this year, whether they should restrict the allowed volume for payments with cryptocurrencies. Uh, most of you will know that um, cash payments in euro are already restricted and limited. And um, there were discussions going on whether they should extend that to cryptocurrencies as well. Seems a little bit difficult, to be honest, um, because how do they want to control it? Um, so that seemed to me a rather theoretical approach. 
but we'll see what they do. Then we saw the SEC report uh, on the DAO basically saying um, that those are securities and that they watched it closely. They even mentioned, uh, you know, the names of, of uh, people involved, what I found really surprising. And um, the cryptocurrency exchanges in the US uh, seem to start to react on that now because qualifying that as security means that they uh, either need to delist those tokens from their exchanges or um, they need a proper license, uh, what not all of them currently have. Um, then the MAS Singapore uh, followed SEC rather more or less immediately and also clarified that they are going to regulate tokens. And uh, I am aware that, that BaFin also is, is working on a paper. They are not saying when they are ready to publish it, um, but uh, they are working on further announcements, so we'll maybe see that sooner or later um, this year. Oh. Thanks. Uh, so I will just add to Nina's list. The Canada also came up with a paper recently on ICOs and how the investors should be careful. Finma from Switzerland is planning maybe this week or in two or three weeks we will see something. Now I'm coming from a legal academic side, so I okay she is a lawyer. She follows very law strictly, but if you understand a very basic principle, there are three questions of regulation: what to regulate, who should regulate, and how to regulate. The first and the last question, and what and how, these are often discussed. These are discussed in every legal text, every legal jurisprudence. But who should regulate? This is a very long debate in jurisprudence, in legal jurisprudence. And a concept of regulation, whether it should be decentered and centered regulation, that comes into play. And I think when we're talking about decentralized market and decentralized economy, why not a decentralized regulation structure? The concept of nirvana fallacy, have you ever heard about this idea of nirvana fallacy? Anybody? Okay. So nirvana in Buddhist concept means you have achieved like the ultimate stage of enlightenment. In legal aspect, there is nothing that is, even if you have done everything legally correct as per your lawyer, they cannot guarantee this is absolutely correct. Because at the end of the day, the court says, okay, this may not be. So the nirvana fallacy works like, even if it's not perfect, it should be workable. How we should make this ICO market workable? Now that's a question because this market has grown and this will stay, this will not grow. It will evolve, so how we can contribute in the evolution? I think the entire idea of this meter was how it can influence the corporate structuring and corporate financing. And I think this is a very interesting discussion of self-regulation. The self-regulation doesn't mean what we regulate or individual self-regulation, but it's a collective self-regulation. Collective means the community as such, how it can regulate. And the understanding of a decentered regulation means the regulation is not a privy of a state, that is the nation state or the government should not be the only regulatory agency, but the civil societies, the participants, the businesses as such must also have a say. And I think this say need to be channeled through associations like Bundestag Verband and other associations. They should come together and create forum in a hub and spoke model, not in a very uh, understanding like you should not make a clear cut distinction, okay, I am US, I am an association from Russia, I'm an association from Germany, but a hub and spoke model where they both all collaborate and then you move to some agencies like EOSCO, which is an international organization for SECs, and ask them, hey guys, look, we have something, please give us an opportunity to place before you and let's discuss on a mutual collaborative way whether it can be done or not. And this should come on a very transparent model. Now how we can propose this kind of things can work. So the community should come up, what I can understand, by a code of conduct. Like what should be the ICO's best practice or what should be the ICO projects do, what the investor should see, what the projects must implement. And that's the community must bring out those things. Then you create those ITO, ICO rating agencies which are already there and ask them to implement those. Create dialogue, a proper transparency dialogue with the Securities Commission or your government, and then you can achieve a decentered regulation because you have already told them what you have done, and there's a full transparency. There may be a lot of issues, there's, it's, it sounds very complicated, it is complicated. 
actually. And that's why all the civil society and all this society of blockchain should come together on this aspect. I, I've just given some examples like engineers, lawyers, all these agencies, they have actually created their own self-regulation body and they are being monitored by the self-regulation body. Why not this blockchain actually can also come up with some kind of self-regulation body which also regulates the best practice code? There are two fix, one that can be done on a short-term basis, one that can be done on a long-term basis. Long-term basis is to create a best practice standard so you have understanding how it works, you have the regulators on board, and you are not afraid. And also this, you can weed out those shitty coins. For the short term fix, immediately the project proponents, if I have seen, like there are certain measures that project proponents or the ICO projects must put into place. First, have a proper legal advice. Without creating a legal structure, please do not do an ICO and mislead the people. The lot of ICOs they are doing without having any legal structure. They do not tell where the money goes, they just focus on Facebook and other PR activities. It should not be done. Not merely a white paper of five pages. At least something, some workable model should be there. Even if you don't have an MVP, at least have some MCP. Wallet security, who is in charge, whether there is security auditing, those kind of things must be taken into consideration. Whether there is an independent auditor, like where the funds, how the funds will be utilized, whether they have a business plan, all these things must come up and see what, how detailed the information is in the white paper, their utilization model, their project model and everything. Uh, appoint, okay, the business report of the con for the contributors. This is one key important aspect, I think, if uh, the lawyers are here and this is an auditing requirement also, you give in a fiscal year there is a report, an auditing report. Why not we also put some kind of business report like how you have burned the money and put it on your website. Be transparent to the projects and the, to, to your contributors. For the contributors, there are a lot of things that need to be checked into. First, they have a hard cap or not. If there is a hard cap on capital that shows that they, have did, they did their research, they know how much they want. They do not want to go to the moon. Uh, then you also have is the code and open source or not, whether it has been done, if it's not, whether there is security auditing, who has done the security auditing, this kind of questions must be asked. Uh, business roadmap and technical roadmap, very important thing. Disclosure of team members, a very crucial point. A lot of projects doesn't show who are the real beneficiaries of the project and community must ask who are the real beneficiaries. There's another trend which I have also noticed these days is they show partners of the projects Sometimes after one week or the, after the ICO, the name of the partners disappear from the website. So try to see whether they have linked the partners from their website to the main partners and also whether they are actually going publicly and asking, okay, these are the partners and please cross verify and try to ask them question, do you have an MOU with them? If not, how you can say you are a partner? Those kind of things. Now the responsibility in a decentralized regulation I have classified under three. Um, there are main three actors. First and foremost is an exchange, and we have the one of the exchange, biggest exchange sitting over here. And the exchange guys have the mo most important, I think, uh, risk also, because they are the reason that ICO also flourished, because they provided the secondary market and the hope for the secondary market. So when they should list the tokens, they should be very careful whether the tokens are securities or not. If they are, what are the legal requirements they have taken? Whether the project that came to list get listed, whether they have a legal structure or not, those things. The project owners must first create a legal entity who should be in lab liability of the tokens and the funds and also be transparent to the community at large. Uh, the rating agencies, uh, these are the agencies that need to develop. There are already some rating agencies, but I do not know that they, have, they follow a universal method or not. But they should come under certain criteria. The first and foremost criteria of the rating is a transparency how transparent the projects are, how the informations are there, and what are the investors' protection or the contributors' protection, so as to say. The novelty of the project, the fund management team, or the who manage and what is the management plan, the business plan and technical plan, and also a legal structure behind the token issuing company and who will be the ultimate beneficiary. Because number of these days, the token issuing company is someone, some foundation, then the beneficiary is some corporation. Who is ultimately liable? This kind of things should be very written very clearly in the white paper. I think Nina can now forward with the other presentation. Yeah, we, I think we are good.
we're, we're, we're summing up. Um, maybe um, there was one thing I was thinking about, Alex, when, when you spoke. Um, you said uh, the VC funds are more, you know, long-term oriented investors. And I read an interesting post, and, and that also comes back to what, what you're saying, best practices. Um, actually, for an ICO to prevent these pump and dump schemes, um, the tokens should be locked for a certain period after the ICO. And personally, I also think, you know, if you're participating in a pre-ICO with a huge discount, your lock-in period should be even longer. But that's my, that's my personal view. And that would be, I think, an easy, an easy fix to um, a couple of those schemes we're currently seeing. Yeah, but... Um, to round it up, um, legally relevant are basically is, is basically everything that you state to um, to sell your ICO. That certainly includes the white paper, and let me say this: a lot of white papers are a little bit formatted as if they were prospectuses, and I think you shouldn't do that. Either you write a proper prospectus and get the approval of the regulatory authorities, or don't make your document look like a prospectus. Um, that's one thing. And especially if you're selling like uh, software license tokens, there is no reason at all to make something that looks like a prospectus. Um, so I really would would recommend um, doing a proper analysis and then setting up documents that co actually contain what they should contain. Um, then you've got typically a purchase subscription agreement and the terms and conditions, those are sometimes combined. Um, and independent of the form, those documents are legally relevant, right? Even if it's just in code. Um, Determine content of legal relationship with you user. Yeah, remember substance over form. Really think about what you're offering, um, and understand the legal environment in which you're playing your game. Um, not only the environment where you're located, but as we mentioned already a couple of times, where you're going to offer your ICO, and then the rest is. Uh, you know, the typical things, uh, obviously, if you get in conflict, especially with the regulatory laws, um, you're threatened by, by fines, even prison. And uh, obviously, we will see sooner or later uh, claims for damages by investors uh, coming up. Um, and then if you are actually going to prepare an ICO, I would always recommend, no matter what type of token you issue, that you discuss it with a BaFin beforehand. Um, you can actually get in touch with them via their online contact formula um, and they will get back to you if you do it properly, um, typically within a week or two, uh, giving you a call to discuss it. And then they will ask you to hand in the drafts of the contracts that you're going to offer um, to the public and only following that they will maybe give you like a written statement, but the call typically gives you already a good feeling where you're at. And maybe some further tips, really work out um, your request to the BaFin properly so that they can understand the legal structure behind it. Don't copy white papers, right? They have seen so many, they will recognize that you just copied it. So don't do that. They get so bored with these things. Um, and don't hide away anything from the regulators. Doesn't make any sense. You know, they will follow you. They will look what you're actually telling on social media and compare it to that what you discussed with them. So it doesn't make any sense to try to hide anything you intend to, you know, tell the wider public. Yeah, that are my like closing remarks. Thank you very much. So, are there any uh, questions? Or if there are any questions, then uh, raise them. Yeah, we have some here, up front. Yeah, just wait because people would like to hear it also in the back. And we are, by the way, also recording. Yeah, this is a question for the lawyers. Um, you said multiple times about you have to consider where you are offering your ICO. 
uh, and you, it's not about where you are formed. So let's say I form in, in Switzerland and I have a website and people go there from I don't know where. They read the documentation and they take part in the ICO. How am I supposed to know? Let's say I get, uh, you said there's 192 countries. I get 192 people that sign up and I must then spend what, all my ICO money to adhere to the legal regulations in 192 countries? How does that work? So Nina, what do you say? Yeah, it's actually very simple. Um, you're only supposed to make your offer where you can legally offer what you offer, right? It's your responsibility to check where you are allowed to offer your tokens. That's not the responsibility of the people around the globe to singly check whether they could actually legally buy into that. So it's, it's, that's simply the way it is. Wherever you want to offer an, a service or a good, you as a seller need to check if you comply with the local laws. And unfortunately, yes, in the digital, digital times, you know, you can simply host a website and, and offer it globally. But that doesn't help, right? Uh, you, you nevertheless, even though the technology enables you to do a global offering, you nevertheless are, are requested to take a look into that. And for the US specifically, um, the recommendation I hear from the US colleagues is really to block the IP addresses, to set in your general terms and conditions the questions um, to uh, confirm that you're not a US citizen to tick the box, to really make sure that you're not offering that where you're not supposed to offer it. Then what percentage of ICOs, current and also past, do you think have been compliant? Not, not very many. <laughs> no, we are just seeing right now, and I think there, there are a lot of um, professionals uh, out of the um, you know, legal tax and audit field trying to work out proper structures right now. And we're seeing more and more teams who really want to be compliant um, and are taking time and effort to actually sort those issues out. But you will nevertheless see tons uh, of more um, ICOs which simply do not care. Okay, oh, another question, Dave? Yeah, I have a question. Uh, if you personally think that the free market should adapt to laws or if the laws should adapt to the free market? <laughs> I like that question. <laughs> Actually, honestly, if I would have, when I decided to study law, if I would have thought about the fact that I would, you know, bind myself to a single jurisdiction, I would have, would not have done it, right? So, you know, that conclusion came too late <laughs> for me. So, um, yeah, you know, the the jurisdictions, the multiple jurisdictions across the globe are, uh, create a lot of challenges, um, but I would not go so far that I would say a global law would be perfect because then you would not have any choice, right? Currently, you at least have the choice between different approaches. You know, you can, you can choose where you settle down. Um, and some law regimes might not be something that I would actually choose to be governed by. Um, so maybe a completely unified global law is also a dangerous thing, but I completely agree that we currently certainly have too many of those. The specific issue you mentioned just now, do you see that um, change in the future with uh, the developments in the blockchain space? So like smart contracts are basically like self-executing law. So there's people that, that are saying, you know, we, we're in a transition from a lawyer capitalism to a programmer capitalism. Do you have any comments on that or what do you think? Um, law is, is like language. Right? It's not a mathematical science. Um, hence, we deal with a lot of gray areas. 
And that's always difficult for a code to um, get along with gray areas. So yes, we can um, surely make law more effective by using smart contracts, but smart contracts will never ever be capable of actually solving all problems. There will always be gray areas which you cannot foresee in a smart contract. Something? Uh, like we lawyers, like even Nina, she has a bar license. When she advises, you are meant to presume that her advice is perfect. Does the coders have it? Do you have an agency that says this coder can be reliable? No. First, you should ask for your own agency. Like that's the, I think the coder should have an own self-regulating agency that says, okay, if you go to this coder, that coder smart contract can be reliable and DAO like have will not happen. Okay, the another thing that comes is a smart contract. It's the script language, right? It just modified. Something else may modify in five years. You cannot say an age old tradition or the profession changes completely. What is like how it can be adopted in the economy? And I think that's a different question. Another question on free market economy, which he asked, are we really staying in a free market right now? I don't think so. This is not a free market, which we have with all the WTO things going on. So if, in, if like the nation state still exists, so we have to work out how we work with the national states and how the municipality when it come, because now municipalities or the states or the cities, they are becoming powerful. How we collaborate this nation state and cities, that's the important question. And this is the question of free market also. And it's a very theoretical question, sorry about that. Okay, any questions? Depends, I would say. If um, the one who's messing around is the one selling the token, I could see some claims by you know the investors being cheated um, coming up. It, it certainly depends. You know, the the problem currently for Germany is that our definition of securities deviates from the EU definition. That makes it quite difficult because the German securities. Um, always require a paper to be issued. So none of what we would call Wertpapier uh, can be tokenized currently in, in Germany, right? The EU definition is wider. And interestingly enough, um, we will have 2018, another um, EU prospectus um, directive coming up, which will apply directly. Uh, in all the member states, and that will introduce also to Germany that wider securities definition. And then, you know, we, we can also see um, uh, this intrider, insider trading rules which apply to securities being applied directly. Cyprus and just tell us set up a company. So 
so I can do exactly what the gentleman over there said, solve 190 times the issue without being worried about it. Otherwise, the ICO must be going to grow. So these are the things that I have. I will just answer the first question. The first question is uh, self-regulation is not working, right? I will give you an example of, do you know how AML and KYC regime in 1988 developed? It was the banks that collaborated and they thought, okay, we need to come up with something. There are a lot of self-regulation mechanism that actually works. The question is, who has to enforce the self-regulation that you can use a state mechanism, but you can create the regulation. I'm talking about a decentered regulation. The top-down approach means you are a part of the regulation also, and you put the enforcement power or function to the state. That actually mitigates a lot of issues and also that gives you a say in the issuance jurisdiction and other issues. Regarding the second question, uh, okay, you want to stay in, say for example, a small island, say for example, Bhutan. I'm giving you an example, there's no crypto valley. Have you, anybody heard about Bhutan? Yeah. Okay, so Bhutan believes in global happiness index, no GDP. You do a bank over there, properly in Bhutan, no one will, no one will attack you because India and China, they are standing over there right now trying to protect each other's territory. So you will be protected properly. But you have to issue, you have to convert the fiat, you have to pay the salary to the employees. The employees will not stay in Island of Man or Bhutan. You have to bring them somewhere and they can trace you. They can lock your bank account, they can restrict your passport, what you can do on that. They have power, if, if they're done with Snowden and others, they can do, they have the power. The regulators are not stupid. And I'll write with Selena now. Yeah. Uh, maybe one thing, don't shoot the messenger, right? So we didn't invent that whole thing here. We are just, uh, you know, telling you how it currently works. Um, so I think we're the wrong ones um, to um, actually, you know, argue for it. Um, indeed, quite the opposite. What we're doing in the Bundesverband is currently to collect all these pain points um, and then present them and try to get, you know, at least those changed, which only um, depend upon the different um, technique that's used here, right? And that the law maybe did not foresee when it was invented 100 years ago. Um, so yes, uh, it's, it's, it's not perfect and Germany is actually not pretty good in, um, in making itself in those, with those regards um, as a good, you know, competitive environment. Um, so unfortunately, you know, when there is EU law, we try to implement it even a little bit more stricter than necessary. Um, and that's what we're seeing in this regulatory area a lot. And that's obviously what we don't like and what we're also trying to bring up to say, hey, you know, we've got a huge crypto scene here in Berlin. A lot of startups coming here, even founders from abroad come to Berlin to found here their companies because they find the software engineers who like to live here. Um, so why you know, don't we allow those people to actually do their business legally here in Germany? That's absolutely stupid. Um, and we should at least try to create a, a, plain, um, a, playing, a level playing field um, for business in Germany compared to other EU countries. Yeah. Maybe just uh, one comment uh, from people who are actually uh, doing ICOs, not myself, but uh, I've been talking to quite a few, and they tell me uh, that actually Germany is the best country to do that and has uh, currently the, l the least practical regulatory uh, limitations. Um, what's your take on that compared to Switzerland, for example? Well, I would say at least in, in Germany, we have a pretty clear view on what's required. So for specific financial instruments, you simply need a prospectus. So what? Write a prospectus, go to the BaFin, let it approve, and then you can legally offer whatever you want to offer. Um, it's sometimes even easier than going for the other route, the software license token, where you are out of all the regulatory implications, because tax actually is even more difficult. And by the way, it's not true that you're, you're clean and safe when you simply go abroad to Gibraltar to I don't know where. 
Um, because if you're offering your, your tokens, those kinds of tokens, in the EU, then um, the VAT is owed in those countries where the users are, right? Uh, and that really makes it difficult. It doesn't matter where you sit. And that's one of those things we're now trying to solve because that's really, it's, it's even more difficult and more expensive, by the way, to solve that issue than to comply with the regulatory things. Yeah. And so we're actually working, I think we will see the first uh, prospectuses sometime soon. Yeah. So yeah, I didn't want to uh, um, make a break. Um, I just have a feeling that we have all a lot of questions. Um, and we have also the uh, opportunity of uh, talking to Arnab and uh, Nina. Um, I'm with you. Um, the legal aspect of an ICO is very important. Uh, though there are much more um, other aspects uh, of it too. Um, proposition, technology, economical model, marketing campaign, um, and much more. And so um, I would uh, propose now um, to make but first, please, uh, if you have bottles or uh, glasses or so, take them uh, with you so that uh, we don't have any uh, issues here. We make a break, 15, 20 minutes. We have drinks here. Just one, one, one thing to add. Aside from those beautiful t-shirts of Astratum, one of which wear, uh, I wear tonight, um, there is um, a box for your business cards and a list if you don't have any, if you want uh, to stay in touch with the organizers of this event and want to be on any you know, circulation email lists or in. Okay, cool. Thanks. So thank you for that excitement I shared with you. So we have uh, now two projects um, um, being presented by the founders and team members. One is a uh, winding tree. Uh, winding tree is um, addressing the um, broken or the expensive uh, tourism markets uh, with uh, cross currency, cross uh, systems, cross uh, border, um, expensive uh, processes and uh, by creating an open source travel distribution platform. Uh, it's a tokenized model and uh, a DAO. A DAO, for who doesn't know it, is a decentralized autonomous organization. Basically, a uh, company uh, been run on, with, uh, on blockchain with smart contracts. Afterwards, we will have uh, ETH Phoenix, ETH Finex, which is an information and exchange platform for Ethereum-based trading and discussion, um, which is a project from BitPhoenix. Augusto, you stay here because uh, you're going to be uh, next. Yeah, Excellent. And um, afterwards, we will have a nice uh, panel with uh, Martin uh, Kappelmann from Gnosis, Nina Siedler, you already heard tonight, Alexander, you already heard tonight, uh, and Will Harbon from ETH Phoenix. So, uh, Augusto, you need access to um, a presentation, and uh, Alex, you need to give us access to, uh, the, uh, to your PC. And uh, Augusto, do you, need, um, do you need Dave? No. You do it on your own? Yeah. Okay. So, I hand over. Right. No, yeah, but that's not me. Yeah, maybe, maybe I can try. <laughs> yeah, so what's yours then? 
um, leaf token leaf generation again. Leaf token. Uh, Dan, do you have the presentation somewhere? Yes. Or it's I, uh, I share a browser. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. 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 There we go. <coughs> yes, I'm going to go there. Well, hello. Hello, everybody. I'm Augusto from Winding Tree. I'm one of, one of the founders of Winding Tree. Uh, what is Winding Tree? Winding Tree is a, pro is a project that will aim to decentralize the travel industry. Yes. Right now, the travel industry is very outdated and has a lot of the common cert centralized problems that we know it. So our motto is um, a travel industry without intermediaries. So mainly we are going to decentralize the travel industry. But that is not what I'm going to talk about today. Today, I'm going to talk about the leaf token generation event. Yes, that's how we call it. Uh, it will be an ACO. For us, it's a generation event that will start once we deploy the smart contracts. Yes? <coughs> so all these ideas came uh, thanks to two, three weeks that we were discussing on Prague. Uh, I arrived to Prague a month ago, and I showed my teammates. And we started discussing each other what our TGE, TGE should have, and we base our ideas on the on that paper that is there, that, uh, the great Vitalik Buterin uh, uh, share share it on the community. So we wanted to solve the um, the problem of, for example, every every smart to every token generation event or ICO should have. Certainty of valuation. What is that? What is the certainty of valuation? Is that, okay, I'm sure that I'm going to send this amount of ether or I'm going to invest this amount of money and I'm going to have this token at at least this certain price. Yes, that is certainty of valuation. Have certainty of participation. So is that I will be able to participate in the carousel. I mean, if I want to invest, I want to join the carousel. I shouldn't have to uh, send a ridiculous uh, high fee to just join the carousel. For example, I want to invest only $100, and I have to use a fee of $10 just to my transaction be mine on one block once the ICO starts. No, I mean, that shouldn't happen. And with the more participation on the platform, the more decentralization. So the more decentralized the platform is, the more valuable it is for us, yes? Another thing, have a, have a validation mechanism. That is something that uh, uh, I don't know, but we haven't seen before. Uh, what ICO uh, builds a validation mechanism where you can say, OK, uh, these guys are doing good. and. Uh, I trust in their project. I trust in their vision. I trust they are reaching these milestones that they say that they are going to, that they were going to reach. And if I don't trust on them, where can I get my money back, or at least a part of the money? Because we all know investing on ICOs isn't a, it, it, it has a risk. 
right? So I can earn money, my token price can go up or it can decrease. If it decreases, I'm going to lose money. So it investing on ICO has a risk. The higher the risk will be the high, uh, the, um, the more time I'm going to be trusting on the platform. For that, we are going to have a special slide on the platform that we are going to talk about the market validation mechanism. Be as decentralized as possible, where the more participation on the on the token on the token generation event, the more decentralized the token is going to be. Be as efficient as possible. So this is if I want to again if I want to invest. 100, uh, if I want to invest $100, I shouldn't need to use a $10 transaction fee to invest that amount of money. So if you ensure participation and you are being decentralized, is the more efficient that your ICO is going to be, and the less money that the investor is going to need to spend to make his investment. Leaf token generation event. Uh, it's going to start on the 1st of November. And the token distribution is, is pretty simple. We are going to distribute the 70%, uh, the 75% of the tokens on public, on public sales. Uh, the 20% of the tokens are going to be distributed to founders, advisors, future team members. All of these tokens are going to be distributed on a vesting schedule, so we are not going to receive that tokens instantly once the carousel ends. Uh, you, you can imagine if the carousel ends with, for example, 10 million tokens, these guys are going to receive 2 million tokens instantly. The token supply will be higher at, at an instant in just one minute. So we don't want that. We are going to have a vesting schedule for that 20% of the tokens. And as far as the 5% for the Winning Tree Foundation, it is going to be able after the market validation mechanism. And it's going to have a vested um, schedule payment too. The Krausel will be uncapped at a fixed price. Why? I mean, why, guys? Do you want to reach that? ridiculous amount of money of $200 million and spend it right away. No, if you have an uncap, uh, if you have an, an uncap carousel, you ensure that everyone is going to be able to participate, yes? If we are going to have an uncap carousel for two weeks, everyone that sends ether to our carousel contract is going to have tokens, and that's what we want. The more people that have Leaf tokens, the more decentralized it is, the more valuable is the platform. Five million USD dollars is the minimum cap, and we have a cap, but it's a soft cap. It's a soft cap of $10 million that once the carousel finish, if the carousel raised more than $10 million, uh, the remaining funds are going to go to the market validation mechanism that we are going to talk about it uh, on the next slide. And the ten million to the um, the ten million dollars are going to go to the one tree foundation that is going to take care of of this money f as long as the market uh, validation mechanism is running. That is uh, that is a minimum amount of funds that we need to ensure that the project is going to be running as long as the market validation mechanism is is running too. So what is this market validation mechanism? Uh, it has some properties, for example, it's going to buy tokens from back from the market. If you are an investor, uh, you don't trust in the project anymore, you can send the tokens back to the MBM and you're going to receive some ether back. The less, uh, the higher time that you wait to send your tokens, the less money that you're going to receive. Uh, the tokens are going to burn uh, once it's received. That is good because uh, if the tokens are burned, it means that the token supply, the total supply will be lower and the price will be higher. Uh, the price is calculated by the total supply of the tokens and the amount of ether that the market validation mechanism has. Uh, what does it mean? <coughs> For example, if we have 
uh, one, 100 tokens and a thousand liters on the market maker, the price per token is going to be uh, 10 liter or something like that. Yeah, it's going to be one ridiculously higher. But what doesn't matter is that uh, the One Entry Foundation is going to be taking funds, uh, taking funds from the market value. The One Entry Foundation will be taking funds from the market valuation mechanism every month, yes, till it reaches the two or four years period. At that time, the market valuation mechanism will be depleted, and we are going to start the schedule of the five percent of the tokens that we go to the One Entry Foundation. So that's why, that's how we fix all the problems that we wanted to solve on our TGE, that is uh, participation, uh, is going to be decentralized as much as we can. We are going to have a, a validation mechanism that no one, there is no one CEO that have ever implemented anything like this. Uh, they just take the money and you trust that they are going to use that money uh, on how much they say on their web paper, uh, basis on promises. I mean, blockchain is trust, but if you can avoid promises and you can program it, that is what is that is why we have these smart contracts, so we can have as less promises as possible. And this is our goal to automate. Uh, to automate the trust as much as we can and to provide validation for, for the plat on the platform for the investors. Um, I think this was all. I have to say three things. Oh, yeah. One is uh, thanks for your time, for allowing us presenting our project here. Uh, another thing, uh, visit our website, we have a Slack. Uh, we have a white paper open for comments. Uh, and another thing, if you are a blockchain developer, we are looking for blockchain developers to show our project. Uh, if you don't have time at least, you can um, meet me at the end of the talk and we can talk about our ideas. Stay a moment. So yes. Thank you, Augusto. So we are also looking for blockchain developers. <laughs> <laughs> I say it first, I say it first. <laughs> We are actually also looking for additional other people. We have different uh, roles. We pay double as much as well. <laughs> <laughs> Our tones are bigger. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thanks for the um, insight into the uh, your proposition and the design of your um, ICO. Uh, just to recall, uh, what's the concept of Winding Tree? What's the concept? What is Winding Tree? Winding Tree is a decentralized platform for the travel ecosystem, open source, maintained by the community. So I think that's pretty much what is Winding Tree. And, and who may use it, and how? Who may use it, and how? Our focus, um, we are aiming to be a B2B solution, uh, the Leaf token, is going to be able to be used as payments and on much other things. We are designing our token to be more smart. We are going to have, for example, transfer methods that are going to allow you to uh, transfer value and also make static calls on smart contracts. Uh, we hope that uh, bringing this open source platform on the travel ecosystem will, will also start a lot of innovation of the on on the industry because for example all the inventory that is going to be on the platform is going to be available for everyone so if you are a, a, a travel startup right now you have to call the big guys and ask for their permission to access their inventory uh, which also takes a lot of time and money and winning is going to be instant and free okay thank you and so 
But um, it's also interesting not only for the small guys, as you said, but also for the big guys, right? I mean, you are also talking with some big ones. Yes. <laughs> yes, we are. We are talking with uh, with airlines, big uh, big hotel chains, uh, big um, big guys in in the travel ecosystem. But well, one thing that we already know that the travel industry uh, always has some, it takes uh, his time to move uh, with the technology uh, and to be up to date. In fact, this uh, is pretty, it's pretty old how, how it is right now. It takes a lot of time to integrate with their technologies. And they share started, for example, using um, JSON APIs like five years ago. So that is a, uh, I think that is um, that is an example of how the travel ecosystem is right now in a technical point of view. Uh, we are here to decentralize and disrupt it. Okay, and uh, it's a DAO. Yeah. It's a DAO. Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. Will be. But it will be, of course. Okay. Of course. About the DAO, yes, it's going to be a DAO. Uh, we don't have the, the answer to the question, how are we going to distribute the votes? Uh, our main, our idea is that it's going to be distributed depending on how much do you use the platform, uh, how much do you bring to the platform. Um, oh well, that's, that idea, it's going to be DO, it's going to be maintained by DO, but uh, the DO implementation is on the roadmap, but it's going to be later. Cool. And uh, so, okay, now we got it. You're interested to get some um, investors investing in, also blockchain developers. Um, <laughs> we too. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we need to breed them somewhere, you know. Um, what about if I'm in the tourism business and I would be interested in somehow benefiting from it? Or I'd just be interested in Winding Tree now. What could be the approach to it, or how, what's the next step? The next step is to enter our website, join our Slack, uh, contact us. Uh, we have uh, two of the founders are taking care of um, talking or with this uh, with anyone who wants to join the platform. Uh, it's a it's a it's a very early stage. We know what we want to do and. Uh, it's difficult, so we aren't promising uh, anything that is going to happen from, from one day to another. It's going to take some time, but we are on the right way, and the less, uh, um, the sooner you talk to us, the better, because you're going to be sooner in the platform. Okay, uh, cool. Um, so, thanks a lot. Uh, Augusto, it was uh, great having you presenting you anyhow around. Um, you have uh, uh, announced that you're basically uh, collecting uh, funds for uh, developing that uh, open source project. And so uh, the audience who is interested may uh, contact then afterwards uh, Augusto or Dave. And uh, I'd say thank you. Um, any questions? Yes, any questions? Okay, here we have some. So, yeah, just you. Uh, hi, yeah. Uh, so my question was, you said, you mentioned it's a B2B business model, right? Yeah. So my question is, why would a public person uh, give you money for this model? How does the user benefit from owning your tokens? So if it's a B2B business model, then how are the users involved? Uh, is it just a speculatory aspect to the whole investment into the coin, or uh, what's the benefit? That's a tricky one. Yes, yes, it's a tricky one. <laughs> what do you? What is your gain on investment, on investing on Leaf token, when we are proposing a, a solution for B two B? Well, first of all, 
uh, it's not only B2B, that is what we are going to aim for. You are going to be able to book hotels and flights using your gift tokens. Uh, if you are tech savvy and uh, you know pretty much uh, uh, about, about blockchain, the, we, you are going to need that to use the Leaf token at the very beginning. But then, of course, we are going to propose uh, public, public web apps and, and places where you are going to be able to use Leaf token as a then user and contact directly hotels, airlines, anyone. But right now, the first, uh, the best place to start implementing uh, all these solutions, we think that is B2B. Uh, that is where we have to remove the middleman there. Okay. So. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Uh, well, right, right now the travel industry is very holopogistic. Olo, so, for example, the 90% of the of the data and and the bookings are are being processed by three, four companies. Uh, these companies has very high fees. For example, we are to, we can talk about 10 and 15 percent, and they decide how much is going to be the fee, whatever they want, and they bring no innovation at all to the travel industry. Uh, the travel industry is a very big one; it's a seven trillion industry, and well. I wasn't the one who came with the idea. Uh, the idea came from Maxim Ismailov, that is one of the founders of, of Roomstorms, that has a private startup, that he suffers all the, all the costs of integration and time that can bring to a simple startup that want to work on the travel industry. So mostly that. We are going to decentralize a very holopogistic industry, very much holopogistic. Maybe I can pick up that, uh, that question. Um, if you look at the uh, travel industry, if you, for example, are booking a trip to um, Argentina uh, through a German um, travel site, which is owned by an American operator, then you have multi-currencies being involved. Um, you pay in Euro, <coughs> while uh, the hotel you're staying in Argentina is receiving it in pesos. In pesos. And uh, the um, payment system in the background is probably built in uh, dollar. And uh, if uh, you make your travel, you're not only booking the hotel, but you're booking a plane, which is maybe from another country, mm, also built with another currency. And you're also booking an insurance, which is again from another country. So you have multi-currency processes which are expensive because they have to be uh, um, um, exchanged. That's what uh, decentralized systems are about in uh, saving money. And um, you have also multi-stakeholders. And whenever you make a change in that uh, process, uh, then it's in the background uh, a hack. And these operational costs behind that uh, multi-stake party uh, process in the background involving uh, multiple currencies is extremely expensive. And we are not aware of it because we have no choice. In the end, you have three or four big companies, only Gopal, running the uh, tourism. But uh, these expenses are paid by the, uh, the, the people either booking the trips or the hotels uh, basically providing the services. And that's, uh, so far as I understand, the, uh, the, um, the um, the 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 not the problem but uh, the 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 point uh, you want to improve basically with winding tree yeah okay we had a yeah uh, what's your MEP going to look like so what where do you actually start yeah good question well, right now we are. We have a smart contracts written for hotels and airline solutions. Our MVP will be focused on on hotels only, yes. And of course, another, another thing that uh, we didn't have there is that we consider that we need to have an MVP before the before the TGE. I think that's something very important, so the people can the investor can see on what they are on what they are invest on what they are putting their money. 
but yes, it's going to be only for hotels. Um, we plan to start integration with airlines that is much more complex the next year. Okay, then um, I would suggest that we just uh, move on. W you can uh, raise the question afterwards, I think, so because we have uh, a panel, and before we have the panel, we have uh, Eth Phoenix. So, um, Augusto, thanks a lot for coming, and uh, good luck for uh, your projects. Maybe last question, but really last one. Um, what is Winding Tree about? Where does the name come from? Is the it's mm, they already asked me this question today. The thing is that I don't know because I didn't came with a name. It was Maxim, so maybe next time if we have Maxim there, we we can ask him, okay. or we can answer that we can answer that on Twitter maybe yes. <laughs> because it's the second time that he came with that uh, with that question. I don't know. I don't know where that's. Came. I just like it. Uh, I just like the name. Okay, cool. So we will ask Maxim. Because uh, I got today asked several times what uh, does a stratum does. So we are black chain, black uh, blockchain venture studio. Um, what does a stratum means? I just pick it up. We have a story as well. That's uh, astratus from Cygnus astratus, which is the black swan, which is the symbol of uh, disruptive uh, moments, which are basically shaping the economy. And stratum, which is uh, Latin for layer, which is a uh, um, um, a concept being used in technology where you build systems based on layers. But so, um, long, not talking too much, uh, here we have another guest, right? Hi. So, hi. Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm Will Harborn from uh, Bitfinex and Ethfinex, and I'll be presenting our, our, our new token exchange. So, Excellent. essentially, Bitfinex is one of the largest Bitcoin and cryptocurrency exchanges, and we're launching a new platform called Ethfinex. And so this is specifically now targeting tokens and many of the tokens that are being created from ICOs. And the reason that's going to be a separate product is that we really see these as very distinct products compared to cryptocurrencies themselves. Um, so just to, before I go into what Ethfinex is, I'm going to recap a bit of the history of Bitfinex, which is quite interesting and has really shaped what we are creating now. So crypto exchanges at the moment are essentially centralized, um, which is obviously strange in an industry all about decentralization. And the reason for that is that a lot of what we do, when it comes down to it, is managing KYC and compliance when interacting with the traditional financial industry and governments. So essentially, we provide a bridge to fiat where users can bring in their money and buy different cryptocurrencies which is user-friendly. Um, it means we can offer a very high speed and liquid service, but it has several drawbacks in that it doesn't necessarily fit with the model of what blockchain has the potential to achieve. And that's led to centralized risk, which we've seen many, many times uh, since the inception of Bitcoin and cryptocurrency exchanges. So Bitfinex, we were hacked last, or last August, and $72 million worth of Bitcoin was stolen. So that, w that was shocking in that at the time, Bitfinex was the largest Bitcoin exchange, but also that it was, it was trading 60% of the volume at the time. So it was seen that if anywhere was safe, it should have been Bitfinex, yet this, this was able to happen. So no centralized exchange was essentially safe. And what happened after this was a week later, we relaunched the platform having dealt with the security breach, which was, I won't go into, but was related to a partner of Bitfinex. Um, and what, what, was happen what happened was that every user's balance was reduced by 36% of the funds that um, they had on the platform. So that was basically socializing the losses of what was taken. Um, and in return, they were given a, a debt token, essentially, where for each dollar of value which was removed from their accounts, they had one dollar of debt token. So that was a novel concept. The alternative would have been bankruptcy, and that's what was expected. That's what had happened in the past from cryptocurrency hacks. So this debt token was tradable and um, could be sold on, on the market on Bitfinex. Um, and, and the day after it was issued, the market rate was around 20% of its dollar value. So that was therefore, you, you could equate that to a 20% chance that we would ever repay those funds to our users. So considering that this had never happened before, that was actually a, a reasonable chance. Um, and over the next few months, slowly, certain percentages of these tokens were redeemed from our operating profits. 
And there was also the opportunity for, for holders of these tokens to trade them for equity in Bitfinex itself or its parent company. And reaching April of, um, April of this year, finally the last of those tokens were redeemed um, and removed from the market with users given one to one dollar value of that, of that token. And up to that point, the, the, um, the value of the token had really grown from about 20% up till nearly about 90, 90, 95% at the time of the full redemption. So the really interesting learning point here was that as an alternative to bankruptcy, firstly, this had worked. But secondly, that tokens have a huge potential beyond just pure equity in that by having a tradable token like this, users had an incentive to remain loyal to the platform, even given the security hack. And actually brought back their volume very quickly um, to continue trading on the platform despite the security breach. Um, and we then saw the, the platform able to return to profitability and therefore able to repay those debt tokens. Um, so that was hugely influential in, in, in our future thinking around what, type, what tokens really are and what their value is beyond just for fundraising um, and as a potential alternative to issuing shares in the company. So going forward, Ethernex was really born in, in the aftermath of this period, um, seeing also the innovation that was happening with Ethereum and projects raising money on Ethereum. And particularly what was really clear was that the true value of these tokens was very strong, strongly related to the communities around the projects. And, it, and that was similar in a way to, to cryptocurrencies, but also had a unique element in that particularly where we really saw value was whenever a network platform was issuing a token, because what you really did was made your platform sticky and really essentially uh, amplified the power of that network. So in, in, in SNX, that's played a key part, and the, tr the trading platform is coupled with a discussion platform where we can almost crowdsource information from community members and experts to really clear out whether which tokens and which projects are valuable and which are just trying to raise money or don't have a strong idea and concept behind them. The second part of Ethernex is around decentralized exchange. So again, coming from the, le the lessons from, that, from the security breach, a lot more funds were stolen than were in active use on the platform at the time. So essentially, users had left their funds with us because they, they thought they were safe or because they, it was too much effort to remove them. Um, and that's something which adds no value to us and basically creates greater risk in the ecosystem. So in the long run, decentralized exchange and making, the, making use of the power of Ethereum and other blockchains has to be the way forward for exchange. And recognizing that, but at the same time, recognizing that it's not, it's not at a mature point for particularly our, our more sophisticated users who trade at very high frequencies means that we're, we're approaching it from a hybrid model where we will allow decentralized exchanges to plug into our exchange but will not yet fully be decentralized. <laughs> the, the third aspect will be, again, to have, to have our own token, um, which will never be sold in an ICO, but will be earned by and given for free to users of our platform, particularly large traders, um, as a reward for their, their use of the platform, and then to incentivize them to continue to use it, and in the long run, to decentralize the ownership of the platform so that the users of it will be the biggest customers and the owners. So coming back to really for us what, and why ICOs are important and why tokens are important, um, it's particularly about communities. And there are these three corners which to us are completely interrelated in, in token and ICOs in a way that isn't true on the traditional stock market. And therefore, t token sales need to be really coupled to the trading, but also to their communities. And so what we hope to achieve here is rather than anyone being able to claim anything in this space where there is a lot of money quickly available to invest, to be able to incentivize the people who are most knowledgeable to do research and contribute it so that traders and investors can use that information and have it available to them to make the best decisions about which tokens are valuable. And in the long run, we want our platform to be generated from that user content and from the user research so that even decisions about what ends up getting traded is based on how large a community ha they have, how well it's weighted by the best experts who contribute the best research about it. 
So these are, again, the same concepts. And coming now back to hybrid decentralized exchange, this is, this, this is a more long-term project. But it, it's clear that we need to find a way um, to not just sit as other exchanges do above blockchain, but to really integrate it into the service we provide. And therefore, we need to work with other projects in the Ethereum ecosystem to essentially what we, what we hope to do is offer an experimentation zone so that new decentralized exchange projects who are building on Ethereum can trade with our users and our liquidity pool and quickly experiment and, and improve. And in the long run, we can then um, adopt that technology ourselves. So, so finally, our Nectar token, which is essentially a loyalty point. So the biggest users of the exchange never pay for these tokens, but the more you trade, the more of these tokens you earn. And you can then use those at the end of each 28-day period, if you wish, to redeem them for a reward from the total fees generated on the platform, or trade them to other members of the incentivization scheme. So this is a way, essentially, of rather than just raising money, of making sure that the people who own our tokens are our biggest customers. And therefore, those who have the biggest incentive in seeing this become the best platform will necessarily also be the ones who have the biggest stake in it. So this is something which I think is very important for all ICOs and all tokens, is that it's not, it's not really a fun, it, I mean, it doesn't have value unless the people who own your tokens are also your users, because that's really where this separates from traditional funding methods, in that you, 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 you augment your, 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 your initial user base by making sure that those who, who have invested and who, have the, who care about your project are also those who will benefit from its success. Um, yeah, any questions? Very welcome. Yeah, so, so essentially, in the long run, this needs to be as well user-rated. So the, the, way, the way that it should work best is that if your rating of a, of a particular ICO or prediction of how well it's going to fare once it goes into development was accurate, you're going to earn reputation as a good content contributor. Um, and people are therefore, you know, your opinion will therefore carry more weight when it comes to rating these projects. And that will in turn then be shown to potential investors or traders when they're making decisions about, about these projects. And it's, it's not possible for us to do all of that due diligence. It needs to be crowdsourced. So this is like something that's obviously going to grow with the amount of people posting and users are involved. So to me, it sounds, it's not like there's something where I want to be the first to try it because like the, the probability of error is pretty high. But if I have a million people posting, <coughs> Absolutely, yes. And I think that's why we get, again, that's where blockchain has the most potential is in, is in network effect platforms. Um, and I guess it's the same, it's the same problem with... So we, we will have a closed beta period and we'll also ma make an attempt to draw in some, some well-known good contributors to kickstart it, yes. You mean how do, how do we know that projects are good if they don't have yeah. those sorts of? So is this just like an upvote, or how do you know for sure? I mean, so so essentially, so, so for example, the initial tokens traded on the platform will essentially be a combination of. I mean, it, it's very clear for so people who are well embedded in the industry to say which projects are good or not. 
um, it's much harder for the average investor to evaluate a project and say whether or not um, there's anything behind it, whether there's real technology. And just to some extent, at the, at the beginning of this, we are going to need to ourselves manage and sort of not, not regulate it, but to be able to at least moderate it. Um, and over the long term, we want to turn it over to users as it, as it matures. So yes, so, so, so the main way to the main way to earn these tokens is by acting as a market maker on, on trading. Um, there will be additional methods of earning it for potential, you know, contribute, contributions. But the, the real value of this token is 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 for market makers. Um, yeah. Sorry, what was that? Governance. There should be some kind of governance there. If I have a lot of uh, nectar tokens, I'm going to be able to make a proposal to make it, I know, some new cryptocurrency listed or a change on the platform, something like that. Yes, yeah, so in concept, we want it to be governed by users. Um, in reality, we haven't seen any successful decentralized governance work. Um, and the initial way we're going to handle that is that la large users or coalitions of users will be able to have, have a real seat in person on, a, on an advisory board. Um, so that they actually you know, will come and discuss and advise on how this platform as, as large stakeholders should be run. In the long run, um, we hope that other projects who are tackling governance in the Ethereum space will come up with better solutions. Um, but that's, that's not our specialty. It's not something we're going to research or put... put um, Funds into. Can you share any details about the technical implementation of the decentralized exchange? So, would it be uh, on Ethereum, uh, fully on chain, hybrid code, like your X out of off chain, settlement on chain, or on side chain, like whatever, an easy go or something like that? Yes, so, I mean, so we're looking at a lot of options and we are working with, or in the long run, it seems unlikely that it will be on chain on the Ethereum main chain, um, and that, uh, that's impossible to say for now. Um, in the short term, the solution we're going for will be, be hybrid so that we will have uh, a, a very similar model to, um, to Bitfinex, which will allow anyone remotely to build up, or, or is already possible using APIs to build up a view of our WebSocket API and see it, view our order books. From that, a, a remote user could, for example, select an order on the order book, sign it using the 0x protocol or any other decentralized protocol which gains traction, and send it back to a specific API on, our, on the Bitfinex or Fnex website. Um, we, we, we are then able to match that and settle it via blockchain, for example, um, but in a lazy fashion where um, we still have control of the order book. So it allows us to put settlement, first of all, onto blockchain, um, on the Ethereum network, um, but in the long run, those sorts of, those sorts of solutions aren't particularly scalable, and we're looking at approaches which will probably involve, t well, working with teams like, well, working with other other projects who are, who are investigating um, that sort of thing. Yeah. So yeah, so I mean, you're saying that order books are by definition not uh, are centralized. Yeah. Order books are centralized, and using your own order books to fulfill decentralized exchange orders, we make for a ticker. It's not really decentralized. Yeah, so I guess there's different aspects of what decentralized exchange means. Um, I guess trustless exchange is is our goal in a way, in that. The biggest problem for us right now is that we have huge, huge custody of funds. Um, that's the first thing that we need to, that's the first risk <coughs> and weakness point which we want to get rid of. Um, so that's something which this does solve. Order books, um, 
there are other ways to decentralize order books potentially. So already we use a, um, or Bitfinex has developed um, a proprietary technology which is, which is now open source um, called Cadamelia, um, well, called Grenache, uh, which basically allows you to use the technology behind um, BitTorrent almost, which can decentralize your order book and spread it over many different nodes so that it's very able to withstand um, DDoS attack and some of the other challenges of centralization without having to be run on blockchain. And there are ways of decentralizing which don't involve the costs and um, inefficiencies of blockchain. Uh, Grenache, yeah, G R E N A C H E. Yeah. So I'd like to jump in. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Because uh, I see there are many questions. I have seen you been interested in going on with the uh, discussion. Um, still, we have. Uh, it's it's late. We are running out of time. Like uh, every time we have an event. <laughs> But it's when you have an audience which is participating uh, that happens, and I think that's a great thing. So um, I'd like to move on to the next um, um, agenda point, which is a panel, where you're also part of it. And um, so if there are no more questions left, then we would move to that uh, panel. A short panel, yes? Uh, and I would invite uh, basically the, um, the panelists to uh, take a seat here. So um, you have seen them, uh, most of them today. And maybe we can um, pick up some, uh, but actually I wanted to, uh, to, to thank you also for your presentation, right? For Eth Phoenix and uh, Martin. Great to see you, yeah, take a seat. Um, we had, um, who else was it, uh, Alex, or was it uh, Nakbar presenting? Alex, was you on, you were on the panel? Yeah. So, um, do you have a suggestion or? Uh, I thought I'm up too. So you, no, okay, so then maybe Alex. So um, we have already talked a lot uh, today, and it's already uh, late, so we like to keep it uh, short. Um, I'd say maybe we can pick up some of the questions either of the audience or of you. Um, I have also a question, and so uh, I'd like especially, I mean, I know you guys, I listen to you, but uh, not to Martin, who came up. And uh, actually, Martin, you um, are based in uh, Berlin. You are uh, very long in the uh, Ethereum and uh, also consensus uh, environment. And uh, you made one of the um, outstanding uh, ICOs in the last uh, month. Yeah, there are many criteria to that. Uh, but um, it would be interesting to uh, learn maybe more about how you dealt with that um, challenge of that um, jurisdiction, you know, what's the token, where to locate your company, how to deal with it. Uh, so that's fine. Yeah. Sure, yeah. So, well, uh, I've co-founded Gnosis. Um, Gnosis is a prediction market platform uh, based on Ethereum. So with prediction markets, you can do all kinds of interesting things, forecast all kinds of things. You can do things like sports betting, but you can also do very interesting parts about information aggregation. I think a few times here there was this, okay, we need to gather information around ICOs. We, we, we want to do uh, predictions and... I always think, yeah, prediction, prediction markets, prediction markets. So they already directly pr provide an incentive to uh, to deliver the right information and don't necessarily need reputation systems because you can just trust someone because someone is actually putting money where where the mouse is. Anyways, that's roughly gnosis. Uh, now the question, yeah, we did an ICO or token token sale. That's how we called it, token sale. But anyways, I mean, it's it's. Back in the days, ICO was not a word to use. Now everyone is using it, so <laughs> whatever. So we did an ICO in uh, April. Um, yeah, what was the question again? So how we prepared it, right? So a few few details. Um, it, first of all, it took quite a while. So I think we started uh, preparing, or Gnosis is roughly two and a half years old. We started looking into the option to do 
um, token sale in um, well roughly a year before the actual uh, ICO, and I think we spent at least eight months um, figuring out at least a fraction of the legal <laughs> questions. I don't, uh, I'm not sure we figured out all, but um, I still don't think anyone figured out all, but uh, we tried our very best to, to well, make sure everything we did was, was uh, fine. Um, well, a few points. So uh, the company itself uh, is based in Gibraltar. Mm. Gibraltar is, um, is one of the many countries that are actively trying to get um, get blockchain uh, related companies uh, to to, ba to be based there. They are um, working on a on a regulatory framework currently, the DLT framework, um, somewhat like the Bit license in New York, but much more um, business friendly. Um, and but but it's still it's still it, it, it's not like um, well I mean I guess there's a scale of jurisdictions and there is there are those ju jurisdictions that where you can just do whatever um, Gibraltar is, n is not such a jurisdiction so they basically they they had already done this model with with, with gaming and gambling and they were one of the first company uh, countries that um, came up with a somewhat um, decent framework around regulation around uh, gaming and gambling and now the reality is that kind of the most reputable uh, gaming companies are based there and and um, and if you don't get a, re a license there then you go to wherever <laughs> um, and now they're a little bit trying to do the same uh, model with with, with blockchain um, companies okay. more specific for I'd like to open up the uh, if someone of the audience has a question. Um, yeah, okay. Hi, um, Markus from eCharge Work. We are working hardly on ICO. Uh, we are coming from the eCharge industry, so we're building fifty thousand eCharge points where you can charge your car, and we want to have the payment on the blockchain technology. And we are hardly working on ICO, but there are some huge people who are trying to talk me to talk to me how to do it best to set up a foundation to to, to set a, a real action gesellschaft or how to find the real people that are teaching me right and not to do a lot of mistakes oh i think you're at the right place <laughs> <laughs> um once pick up the uh question the um, question was, I think, uh, for you, Martin. Yeah. Um, hmm. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, I mean, there there are many aspects. So, so we um, when we we decided our for our jurisdiction. Well, of course, Switzerland was the country at that time most. Uh, most project used so so there's kind of foundation model um, and there is uh, there's this one law firm basically MME that does that did kind of a ton of, of, of those token sales at that time we, we decided against them f or against that route for two reasons first of all it always it, it, it didn't felt or it felt always a bit well not I, I wouldn't say uh, kind of, kind of saying, oh, it's a dona donation for the foundation, or that it sometimes it f felt a little bit strange. Um, we are happy with Gibraltar, um, but I'm sure there are many other um, routes or companies. I don't can can give you something more specific. Yeah, I guess I don't have a good answer. <laughs> Maybe I can pick it up. Um, 
So I I indeed, uh, if you look uh, tonight, the topic is ICO, and uh, the people um, here being uh, present are involved in one another way. Um, and uh, we are also to some extent uh, working together on that topic because uh, you have until today not one place to go because you have many ex experts having to work with it. And ICO is not only a financial no. process, it's not only, uh, yes, it's, it's a community, exactly, so it's a, a social innovation blockchains. Uh, it's also... Uh, I think you first have to dig into uh, the strategy. Uh, actually, what's about your proposition, and um, to um, you know, to uh, positioning rights amongst uh, existing uh, concepts on the market, but also upcoming and anticipated uh, uh, propositions, and uh, then you basically need to carve out your potential uh, position, and then maybe your way forward. And uh, this may define the uh, token design you have. Um, and this uh, may then define your jurisdiction you have and uh, how you then try to reach the goals with new tools. You know, we have now new tools. I mean, we, we all know this. I mean, I can ask you what are the basic uh, uh, communication aspects you need to consider when you have an ICO. Alex, you know it too. Um, yeah, I mean, communication. Is it still on? Yeah. Um, yeah, it has a lot of um, elements. So uh, for, for myself, when I'm uh, investing in any projects, uh, of course, website is, is one source. Then you got all the Slack communities, Telegram communities. You got all the big blogs um, like, like Bitcoin uh, Magazine or, um, or uh, Coindesk or whatever there is. Um, so there are many channels, um, Twitter, influencers. Uh, you, you, could, you could make a long list. Um, of channels uh, where you would actually need to reach out um, to get the attention of the crypto uh, world. Yeah, it's it's pretty pretty complex and it's um, rolling. So there's more and more coming every day. So, so um, this is uh, just an example. We have also with the introduction of the ICO as a new finance financing tool. We have uh, basically new marketing tools coming up, which are different than the previous one. Uh, you have also you know, 20 years ago, you had an IPO roadshow. Today, you have an ICO roadshow. And uh, you don't have any more the uh, closed clubs like you had uh, in fireside chats in Switzerland, but you have meetups and you have a global community. So um, this is why, for example, we uh, reach out to uh, Korea. Um, we translate our uh, events also in uh, Russian. And uh, I know you guys do it also in Spanish, so you need to uh, tap into the uh, global uh, crypto community, which is uh, global. And um, this is just one aspect, you know. And um, so... Um, Quite yes, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, I see there's another question. Um, both both very uh, very good questions. Of course, we are uh, wrapping our heads around this. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not not in a partner role, so I'll, I don't decide anything on my own. I have some influence, um, but in the end, it's it's mainly the the partners who decide on such strategic topics. So we are discussing it very actively as of now, um, and um, this this will become pretty relevant soon, I guess. Um, namely. Uh, latest, uh, in case any of the existing portfolio companies um, I mentioned too, there might be others uh, from, from more conventional markets also considering um, to tokenize uh, parts um, of, of their products. And um, I'm pretty sure that this will uh, definitely pop up um, within the act, uh, actual portfolio. And um, yeah, um, as, I, as I mentioned before, I think um, this, this could be a, um, a path to go actually to, to get equity financing uh, in the very early days, um, build your product, um, build up um, the, the strategy around it, uh, design everything and then do your token sale later on. And it seems to be kind of a best practice for now. We've seen that with all the very big ICOs as well, that these guys um, 
don't just directly raise money uh, through ICOs before having built anything. Um, and I, th the market will mature uh, on this uh, topic. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm very confident um, to to see more venture financing players entering entering this field. There are many challenges, though. Um, it's not only about picking the right assets uh, and, uh, uh, and and investing. It's also about the um, infrastructure, for example, right? So what what do you do with the coins? Um, do you store it all uh, on a on a ledger on a on a keep key? Uh, put it in a bank vault. Um, how do you liquidate and when do you liquidate? Um, how do you pay off your, your LPs uh, in the end? So there's a lot of structural questions um, uh, we, 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 we still can't uh, answer and, and there will be experiments around this. Um, yeah, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm very confident that, that more and more VCs uh, and, and other funds are going in this direction. What was the second part of the question again? Sorry. Yeah, it's. I mean, in the end, it's it's basically the relation between uh, the VC funds and their limited partners, the, the investors behind, kind of, and their specific agreements, the LPAs, limited partner agreements, and there you have some clauses on which kind of assets you're allowed to invest, and and of course you can have decisions overruling um, such such clauses. Um, that's that's possible. I think it's much more tricky on the issuer side um, than on the on the buyer side. I would say. Yeah. Okay, here we have another question. And bring. I mean, the, the problem is that bringing on team members is a very long process. So, you know, if we begin taking someone on now, it may take months before they actually join the team, um, for security reasons, but also because there's a big learning curve. Um, so it's something that so people management for these kind of businesses is incredibly difficult. Um, I think it has to be taking a long-term view of thinking that even if there is a crash. We expect this industry to continue growing, and it's worth investing in people now, um, with the expectation of that being of being ready for the next exponential liftoff. Okay, so I can see us actually are tired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, then I just uh, would suggest if that's fine with you, come to an end, and uh, I would like to thank you all for uh, coming and making this uh, happen. <laughs> I also like uh, to thank you all for coming for your interest in that uh, amazing new uh, world and uh, so hope to see you soon and uh, whenever you have a question related to uh, that topic um, you have here people you can uh, contact address and know where to find so uh, long story uh, or no what is it short story long words whatever uh, here you can get something to drink and to eat and uh, see you next time.